When you solve the Schrodinger equation in three dimensions using separation of variables, you get two differential equations which are dependent on either radial or angular part of the wave function. In the previous video, I talked about the angular part which were constructed by Legendre functions. In this video, we are going to see how we can come up with a solution for the radial equation. To solve this differential equation, first multiply both sides by r, which yields this one. Using a new function called ur, now we should write r and its second derivative in terms of u. Now this term is exactly like this term in the equation and can be transformed into a solely dependent on u expression. Our next step is to rewrite the equation in terms of ur, then multiply both sides by h bar squared over 2mr and finally take the energy term to one side to have this equation. This is the last equation that we came up with. It is called the radial equation and it looks like one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. There's a difference in terms of their potentials and the radial equation has an additional term called centrifugal term. This potential in the radial equation is called the effective potential. Pay attention that if your particle is in a potential Vr, you should add this centrifugal term and then solve the equation. For example, these are the diagrams of the effective potential for an attractive potential. When L is zero, the effective potential is equal to attractive potential. These are centrifugal terms for L1 to L6, and these white diagrams are effective potentials for L1 to L6. Let's solve this radial equation for this potential, which is called the infinite spherical well. In the well, the wave function is non-zero, and we can write the equation putting Vr to zero. If we multiply both sides by minus 2m over h bar squared, and take the centrifugal term to the other side of the equation, we have the second derivative of the wave function on the left and the wave function with a coefficient on the right. It may remind you of some equations like this which have a really straightforward answer. But because of this term here, we get into trouble and can't easily solve this differential equation. So let's at least name this term k squared and rewrite the equation in which k is equal to the square root of 2me over h bar. Before solving this equation, pay attention that this m is the mass of the particle, not the quantum number m we talked about in the previous video. Let's first talk about the boundary condition and different regions of space that the potential is acting on. For r's bigger than a, the wave function is zero because the potential is infinite. We know that the wave function should be normalizable, meaning that this integral has to be one over the whole space. So if the wave function is not zero where the potential is infinite, the normalization condition is not met. And in fact, the particle needs infinite energy to overcome the infinite potential, which is physically meaningless. Our next boundary condition suggests that the wave function has to be zero at this point, meaning that the particle is confined to just this region and the wave function is mathematically consistent with the wave function outside the well. For zero L, our differential equation is so familiar and our reduced wave function UR has the form of sine and cosine. However, you should pay attention to this region of space where we approach the center. As r approaches zero, our wave function blows up because cosine is finite and r gets smaller and smaller so that the wave function goes to infinity. But for the first term, both sine kr and r go to zero and the wave function is finite and also normalizable. So far, we know that for L0, in an infinite spherical well, the reduced wave function is this and the centrifugal barrier is absent. And physically speaking, there is no force to push the particle away from the origin. So the wave function can be a non-zero constant at the center. But we know that the wave function is zero at r equals a, and we can find allowed values of k using this equation. 
And finally, these are our possible energies that our particle can have based on the probability which is given by this normalized wave function. Pay attention that for the normalization condition is spherical coordinate, these two integrals should be met. So based on the previous video, we know the normalized angular wave function to be this for L0. And today we calculated the radial wave function for L0. Pay attention to the quantum numbers written by n, l, and m, and we'll talk about them in more details later. And finally, after a few videos, we have just managed to find the wave function for the infinite spherical well, and just for L0. So, these are the energy and wave function expressions for a few of the first energy levels. Pay attention that stationary states are shown by n, l, and m, which are our quantum numbers. And uh, the energy level is just dependent on n. To talk about non-zero l's, we should start with this equation without changing r. We know that the potential is zero in the well, so we expand the derivative and put all the expressions on the left side of the equation. This term here is k squared. Now, we set kr to be x and find r in terms of x and also its derivatives. Then we rewrite the equation in terms of x, which leads to this equation in which we have a second order derivative with coefficient x squared, a first order derivative with coefficient 2x, and r itself with these parentheses as its coefficient. There is a very well studied equation called the Bessel's equation in which the solutions j and n are derived using Frobenius method. We can change our last equation into the Bessel's equation by changing our function to z times x2 minus half. We can write down the answers to this equation in x and also in r. And the solutions of this equation, which is called the spherical Bessel's equation, are like this. These types of functions are spherical Bessel functions of the first kind, of order L with this recursive solutions, and the other type is called spherical Neumann function, which are represented by NL. For example, these are the answers for L0, and these are two other examples of Bessel functions for L1 and L2. By expanding sine and cosine, we can see the behavior of these functions near the origin. As you can see, the Neumann functions blow up at the center, and as a result, B has to be zero, because we don't want our wave function to be infinite at some point. So from now on, we should just care about the Bessel functions of first kind. Based on the boundary conditions of the infinite spherical well, J has to be zero. But there is a problem. We cannot find a good expression for zeros of the Bessel functions. So we use numerical methods, and as you can see, J0, J1, J2, and J3 are illustrated here. Let's denote these zeros by beta and L, and for example, for J0, the first five zeros are shown on the graph. So, we can find different Ks based on our betas, and now we have the energy levels which depend on N and L, and these are the wave functions. Pay attention that for each energy level, we have two L plus one different M's. And when our particle is in the energy level of E and L, there are two L plus one wave functions associated with it. In other words, we can say that our energy levels are two L plus one fold degenerate.